fanatic? How many of you ever met a sports fanatic? Met some sports fanatic? How many of you are, maybe, possibly? All right, sports fanatic. How do you know when you have met a sports fanatic? When you met someone who is, who is passionate about sports, how do you know that? They know every fact that we said. They know all kinds of facts about that particular sport. Okay. They believe wearing clothing will help them win the game. <laughs> <laughs> says they believe that wearing certain clothing will help that team win the game. They get fired up. They get fired up, Kathy. <laughs> Kathy wouldn't do anything about that. <laughs> Eat, drink, and sleep sports. Yeah. It's all they can talk about, right? Someone who is passionate about sports, that's all they want to talk about. In the, and they spend their money on these things, right? They buy, they buy jerseys and, and hats and shirts, perhaps. And, and they buy uh, signed baseballs, perhaps, or, or, or cards. Uh, they, uh, they get season tickets, or maybe they'll uh, pay extra for their satellite or their cable company to be able to see the games on TV. Uh, they spend time not only watching these events, but listening to commentators talk about and, and, and analyze that particular sport. Uh, they, they do things like uh, get involved in, in fantasy leagues, right? This is the person that you are worried is going to have a stroke when they watch a game, right? Because they get, so, they get so worked up. It's not hard to tell when you've met someone who is passionate about sports. This morning, we're starting a new series on the book of Galatians. Uh, the book of Galatians, dealing with the region of Galatia. Uh, and we're going to meet a man who was passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to meet a man who was passionate about God's grace. It's all we wanted to talk about. The gospel is what got him up out of bed in the morning. The gospel is what he spent his time and his energy and his resources on. If you were to meet this man today, it would take you about 10 seconds to figure out that this guy is passionate about God's grace. He is passionate about Jesus Christ. So I'd like you to open your Bibles to the book of Galatians. We're going to be camped out here for a while, so I'm going to ask you to do a few things. Number one, make sure you bring your Bible every week. If you don't have one, if you forget your Bible, we have Bibles by the door. Make sure you pick one up when you come in. It'll make things in uh, studying it a lot easier for you. Uh, you might want to bring a pen if you want to take notes in, in your outline. Uh, here's something else I'm going to suggest and ask that you think about doing. And that is, I'm going to suggest that you, uh, during the week sometime, sit down when you have about 15 minutes. That's all the longer it'll take to read through it. Read through the whole letter in one sitting. Okay, the whole letter of Galatians, read through it in one sitting this week. And uh, if you can do that every week that we're in this study, it's going to help you understand uh, the book of Galatians a lot better. Because if you understand the whole letter, right? if, you've been, if you sat down and you, you have a greater understanding of the whole letter itself, it's going to really help you as we go through piece by piece and look at the smaller parts. And now I'm going to do my best to bring as, uh, you know, to teach you as many things as I possibly can about this letter. But you're going to get more out of it if you invest a little more in it. That makes sense? If you've got more skin in the game, uh, you're going to get more out of uh, what we're looking at in this series. Now, before we read verse 1, I want you to understand that I do not intend to rush through this, this letter. We're going to take our time. I'm pretty passionate about what's in here, so I want to make sure we take our time, work through it slowly, okay? So you understand that, right? So let's uh, go to verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. You ready? You got it? Paul. Stop there. We're going to camp out on that word all morning. Right? Now at this rate, it should take us, I figure, about to 2025 till we get through, get through the whole letter. Uh, maybe not quite that long. It'll pick up. But in order to understand this letter, we need to understand some things about the author. Now, obviously, if you understand how the Bible was put together, the Holy Spirit is the ultimate author. The Holy Spirit uh, worked through the Apostle Paul uh, to write this letter. Uh, but we need to understand some things about Paul to understand why he's so passionate about the things that he's passionate about. First thing you need to know about Paul is this. His name was not always Paul. 
His parents gave him the name what? Saul. His parents gave him the name Saul. He was named after Israel's king Saul. He was born around the time uh, that Jesus was born, somewhere around that same time, but in the city of Tarsus. His, uh, his parents, he, he was raised in a very strict Jewish-speaking family. His family was from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, that is a very highly respected tribe in, in the Jewish community. And when we meet Saul as an adult, we find out he grew up to become a Pharisee, a Jewish religious leader. You need to understand that Paul, or that Saul, was very passionate about his culture. He was very passionate about his traditions, about his nation, about his religion. He was more than what I'll call a fair weather fan of the Jewish tradition and religion. He was a fanatic. And I think you know the difference. You probably have seen the difference between people who, who like a team and those who are you know, over-the-top, paint-your-face, fight-you-in-the-parking-lot kind of fans, right? There's a difference between the two. You know enough about me to know that I like the Yankees, right? And I take a lot of heat over that. You know, and, I, and it's okay. You know, I've got a hat, I've got a couple shirts, a pretty sweet tie with the Yankees on it. Uh, but if they lose... Or they don't make it to the World Series, I'm telling you, I don't lose any sleep over that. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't make me grumpy. Uh, it doesn't bum me out at all. Right? There's a difference between those who like a team and those who are fanatics about a team. Saul was a paint-your-face, season ticket holder, fight you in the parking lot kind of a guy when it came to the Jewish religion. He was a fanatic. So when Jesus comes along, Saul sees Jesus as a bitter rival. Saul sees Jesus as the enemy. Saul believed that Jesus was a blasphemer. Saul believed that Jesus was a heretic. And he believed that everyone who followed Jesus, and who believed that Jesus is the Messiah, that they should be killed, put to death just like Jesus was. When we first meet Saul in Acts chapter 7, if you would turn there, we're done in Galatians for today, after our one word exploration. We'll get back to it next week. I want you to go to Acts chapter 7. Here's where we first meet Saul. Now here's what's happening in Acts 7. There was a Christian named Stephen, and Stephen was arrested by the Jewish religious leaders for proclaiming the name of Christ. He was being put on trial, one of these false trials, the same kind of deal they did with Jesus. But Stephen doesn't back down. And uh, I would encourage you this week to take some time and read through this sermon that Stephen preaches. It is powerful. And this is uh, the kind of sermon, it's not just a step on your toes kind of sermon. This is a smack you in the face kind of sermon that Stephen preaches to these Jewish religious leaders. And I want you to take a look at what happens. Uh, we're going to start in, well just look at verse 51 real quick. Just so you know, I'm not... Uh, pumping this up to more than what it was. Uh, verse 51, what does he call the people in his audience? Stiff neck people. This is a smack you in the face kind of a sermon. It is powerful. And their reaction we see in verse 54. Verse 54, when they heard this, when he was done preaching, they were, what's the word? Furious. So furious, it says that they were gnashing their teeth. Have you ever been that mad? So mad that you, your teeth were gritting together. Right? They were furious. Their teeth were gritting together. And it says, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city. They began to stone him. Now watch this. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named, what? Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. When he said this, he fell asleep, he died. The next one says, and Saul was dead, giving approval to his death. 
if we could put it in these terms, if, if Saul were to stand here, he would say this. He would say, hello, my name is Saul, and I am passionate about putting this Jesus nonsense to rest. Had enough of it. That was Saul. That was Saul. And, and after this episode with Stephen, this great persecution breaks out in the city of Jerusalem. And the Christians, many of them, were forced to scatter and flee the city. We see Saul again in Acts chapter 9, if you'll go there. Uh, after this, this persecution breaks out, Saul's not done. It's not enough for him that they had to, the Christians had to flee the city. He's like, no, 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 I'm going after them. Check out verse 9. I'm sorry, chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So here's his plan. He went to the high priest, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in this city called Damascus. So it, that if he found any who belonged to the way, those are Christians, whether they were men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So the plan is this. I'm going to go to the city of Damascus. And with your permission, I'm going to, if I can hunt down any Christians, I'm going to bring them back. And we're going to put on a trial here, and then we'll put them to death. That was the plan. But something happens on the way. Something happens on the way. He literally met Jesus on the way. Now, you know you're in trouble when Jesus himself gets up off the throne from heaven to come and give you a personal smackdown. You know that you are in, in deep trouble when that happens, yes? Check it out. Verse 3. Uh, let's see, we are in chapter 9, verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. Now in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision, saying, Ananias. Now that would be a pretty tense moment too, wouldn't it? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Now just pause. You thought it was te a tense moment when he heard the Lord saying his name. Things got a whole lot more tense just there. Watch this. Here's this man. He said, there's a man named Saul from Tarsus and he's praying and in a vision... He's seen a man named Ananias. He knows what you look like, Ananias. Come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Check out his reaction in verse 13. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he's come here. He's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And I love that Ananias just is obedient. That's great. Ananias in verse 17 says, He went to the, the house and he entered it, placing his hands on Saul. And he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. And he got up, and he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. So here's what's happening. Saul gets this uh, interaction, this personal interaction with Jesus Christ. He believes the gospel. He becomes a Christian. He gets, he gets baptized. And then he answers God's call to become a pastor slash missionary slash you know, author of half the New Testament. Later on, he does change his name to Paul. But I want you to check out verse 20. 
It says in verse 20, at once he began to what? Preach. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah. And all those who heard him were astonished. And they asked, wait a minute, uh, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And, and hasn't he come here to take them prisoner to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. So just imagine the scene, right? Uh, you're, you're in a church in Damascus, right? And, and you show up to church that morning, and you're looking through your bulletin. And there in the bulletin, you say, oh, that's pretty cool. The Corinthian Choir is going to be down at the other church. That's pretty good. Go check that out. Oh, Athena. She's running Zoom with this week. That should be good. What, what's, what's this? The, the special speaker for today is, is Saul? What? Where's the nearest exit, right? That's what you would be thinking. Is this some kind of joke? I know all about Saul. He's our speaker today? It would have had to have been awkward at first, right? I mean, you understand. It would have been kind of weird at first. But Paul came and he preached a message of forgiveness. Pause and just let that sink in for a moment. It's very possible that there were people in the room that day that Paul had been, or at least had a part in, carting off to Jerusalem to their death. When we talk about preaching a message of forgiveness, there were people in that room probably that day that needed to forgive him. Paul preached a message of dramatic transformation through the power of God's grace and faith in Jesus Christ. Now, keep in mind this episode back with Stephen. Let's take our, take our minds back to Stephen. He was stoned, put to death in large part because of Saul. And then this, this great persecution breaks out in the city. Now, because of that, there are Christians who leave the city. They flee all over the place. One of the places that they went was this place called Antioch. Check out Antioch up here where it's circled. To its left, you'll see Tarsus. That's where Saul is, is from. Uh, Jerusalem, this is called Asia Minor, so Jerusalem will be up that direction. So there were Christians who left the city and went to this place called Antioch. And while they're there, uh, they, they take the gospel with them, and this church begins. And it grows, and it grows. And it grew to the point uh, so rapidly that word of this church got all the way back to Jerusalem. Now that might not mean much to you in today's world where I take a picture of you, put it on Facebook, and the entire world knows within a matter of 10 seconds. That, they didn't have Facebook, right? So the fact that this church is growing so dynamic that word of it reaches back to Jerusalem is significant. You understand? Something special is happening in Antioch. And so the Jerusalem church says, wait a minute, we've got to figure out what's happening here. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? What's happening in Antioch? So they send Barnabas to go check it out. So Barnabas travels to Antioch, and he finds out this is a really great church. Here are people who used to be worshiping idols, and now they have repented of that. They've accepted Jesus Christ, the gospel of his, of his death and his resurrection, and they are radically transformed. This is a really great church. These people in Antioch were doing some amazing things because they were passionate about Jesus. Now, here's a really interesting twist of this story. Barnabas looks around, he sees what's happening, he realizes, uh, I need some help. And so he decides he's going to go to Tarsus to go find this guy named Saul. He's going to ask Saul to come back with him to Antioch to help him teach. Now just think about this. This church in Antioch exists because of what Paul was doing to persecute Christians. And now he has the opportunity, because of God's grace in his life, he has the opportunity to go to Antioch and teach the Christians there about God's grace, about God's mercy. It's an amazing story. So he does that. Paul and Barnabas teach in Antioch for a year. And then if you look at Acts 13, in Acts 13, while the leaders are praying, it says there that the Holy Spirit 
told them to set apart Saul and Barnabas for this missionary trip. So they lay hands on them, they, they pray for them, and then they send them out to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to go and preach the grace of God. And that's what uh, Saul and Barnabas do. They set out preaching Jesus, and they begin to plant churches in this region of Galatia. And if you look, uh, you're in chapter 13, just kind of scan your eyes over chapter 14 and beyond. You'll see probably some titles there of cities. Cities like Iconium, cities like Lystra and Derb. You'll see these cities. They were all part of this region called Galatia. So let's see if we can make sense of that. Let's think of it in terms of the code. Right? The Cove region has a number of towns in it, right? So Roaring Spring, uh, Martinsburg, uh, Curryville. I don't, is Williamsburg part of Cove proper? I'm not sure. But you, know, you, you take uh, the Cove region. You've got these little towns in it. It's all known as, as the Cove, right? <coughs> so that's Galatia. You have these various Roman province cities in this region called Galatia. And that's where they went preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And planting these churches. Now there's one more thing you need to know. It's in Acts chapter 15. We won't take time to read through it all. It would be a great uh, thing for you to read this week. In your quiet time. In Acts chapter 15. Sometime after. Saul and Barnabas finish. Their missionary journey through Galatia. Right? They go. They preach Jesus. They establish churches. They work their way back through. They're back in Antioch. Sometime after that. These men show up, and these men are known as Judaizers. They're coming from Jerusalem, and they're coming with a false gospel. And they come into Antioch, and they start teaching that in order to be saved, you have to trust Jesus plus follow the law of Moses. You have to trust Jesus plus be circumcised. You have to trust Jesus plus uh, eat a certain diet. You have to trust Jesus uh, plus do all the ceremonial kind of things of, of the law of Moses. They were preaching a false doctrine and a false gospel of Jesus plus. And so there's this big uh, controversy, which then uh, turns into this big meeting that happens. And at this big meeting, uh, the issue is, is faith in Christ alone enough for salvation? Or is it Jesus plus something? And when the dust settled, the conclusion was this. Salvation is God's gift of grace, and we receive it through faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing. The message of the gospel is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's it. Now I tell all this to you about Paul's life and about his journey of faith to tell you this one thing about him. Paul was passionate about Jesus. Paul used to be passionate about teaching the law of Moses. Right? We saw that. But after he met Jesus, Paul became passionate about God's grace. Paul used to be passionate about persecuting Christians. But after he met Jesus, Paul became passionate about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul used to be passionate about putting people in bondage. But after he met Jesus, he became passionate about seeing people set free. Set free from their sin. Set free from the idea that you have to earn your way to heaven. Paul was passionate about Jesus, and when you understand his background, when you understand where he comes from, you begin to see why he's so passionate about God's grace. His nationality, his religious activities... His family name, his good deeds, they were all powerless to rescue him from hell. And even though he did not deserve it, Jesus extends to him grace. And when we see this episode in his life, we begin to understand why Paul is so passionate about the gospel and God's grace. Because Jesus could have got up off the throne and zapped Paul for what he was doing to the Christians. But instead, Jesus offers him what? Grace. Check out Philippians with me. We're done in Acts for today. If you go to the right, go to Philippians. I want to have us look just through this window, this little window into Paul's heart. 
into his mind and, and what he was passionate about. And we see another window into that in Philippians chapter 3. Now there were some similar things happening in Philippi, in the church in Philippi, with these Judaizers showing up and, and teaching this false gospel of Jesus plus something. He identifies them in verse 2 of chapter 3 when he calls them dogs. He said, watch out for these dogs, those who do evil, the mutilators of flesh. He was talking about those people who were showing up and saying, you have to... Now remember, the Gentiles in those days, they didn't uh, circumcise children. That wasn't part of their tradition. That was something a Jewish person would do. And so these Judaizers were saying that if you're a Gentile and you come to know Christ as an adult... You have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And Paul calls them mutilators of the flesh. There's another um, passage of scripture when he identifies them. He says, I wish they'd mutilate themselves. That's what he said about it. He's pretty passionate about this issue. And he calls them dogs. And he says in verse 3, For it is we who are the circumcision, talking about the Jewish people, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh, now look at this. Though I myself have reason for such confidence. If there was ever anyone who could have confidence in the flesh, if that's what really mattered, then Paul could step up and say, I could have confidence in the flesh. Here's what he says. If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I've got more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. Right? That was according to the law of Moses. I'm of the people of Israel. Right? He's a natural born Jew. Not grafted in. He says, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. That's a highly respected tribe. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, I'm a Pharisee. As for zeal, I persecuted the church. Obviously, I'm a fanatic. As for legalistic righteousness, I'm faultless, he says. Look at verse 7. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Nothing else mattered to Paul as much as Jesus. He was passionate about the gospel. He was passionate about God's grace. He was not a fair weather fan about his faith in Christ. He was a fanatic. So you can imagine the moment when Paul gets word that this group of Judaizers, they weren't getting any traction in Antioch because Paul and Barnabas were there and they put that down. They weren't getting any traction and so these Judaizers decide they're going to go north. And they go north into the region of Galatia, and they begin to preach their false gospel to all those churches that Paul and Barnabas had planted. Imagine the moment when Paul gets word that these churches that he had planted are now being attacked with a false gospel. This gospel of it's Jesus plus the law of Moses. And not only that, these Judaizers went up into these, these cities in Galatia, and they're saying, listen, this Paul guy, he's not even a real apostle. Don't listen to him. He's not even a real apostle. He's te he didn't even teach you the full gospel. Here's the full gospel, they said. It's Jesus plus. And some of them were buying into it. And it broke Paul's heart. He was mad about it. As we read through this letter, we're going to find out just how passionate Paul is about God's grace. We're going to find out just how passionate he was about freedom in Christ, freedom from sin, freedom from the law. We're going to find out just how passionate he was about Jesus. It's going to be an exciting letter. What are you passionate about? I don't want you to answer out loud, but I want you to think honestly about what you're really passionate about. Are you passionate about politics? Maybe you're passionate about sports. Maybe, maybe you're passionate about your leisure activities. 
Maybe you're passionate about your family. Maybe you're passionate about some good cause. I met someone one time who, who was absolutely passionate about Bon Jovi, the singer. They knew, they knew everything about him. You know, the t-shirts, good, all the concert, have all the albums, all that. Absolutely passionate about Bon Jovi. Now, I think that we can all agree, at least I would hope we would be able to agree, that being, uh, having a passion for Bon Jovi is a pretty meaningless passion in the big scope of life. Yes? Uh, a life lived for Bon Jovi is not going to matter much in eternity. Would you agree with that? It might be possible, it might be possible that you and I have some passions in our lives that are kind of empty and meaningless. It might even be possible that we have some passions in our lives that are sinful. Paul was on his way to Damascus with a passion in his life. But it was a sinful passion. He didn't even realize it until Jesus showed him where he was wrong. It is possible that we have some passions in our lives that are either empty, meaningless, or even sinful, and some of those things need to change. It might also be possible that we have some, some passions in our lives that are good. But they might fall short of something that really matters. It's possible we could be passionate about our family or passionate about helping others. But if we're not just as passionate about Jesus, then those passions are just as meaningless as a passion for Bon Jovi. Because they fall short of what really matters in life. Here's what I mean. I can be passionate, and I think that I am, about my family. I love to spend time with my family. I love to invest time and energy into my family. But if I never lead them in what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus, then my passion for them has fallen short of what really matters. I can be passionate about helping others, giving out food, giving out clothing. But if I never share with them the life-transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then my passion for them has fallen short of what really matters. It doesn't take long to figure out what a person is passionate about. It doesn't take long. It's not hard to tell when someone is passionate about Jesus. Now, I'm not trying to elevate a person here. I'm just using an example. We talked about Tim Tebow a few weeks ago, right? Tim Tebow, I'm sure, is pretty passionate about football, right? Pretty passionate about football. How long does it take to be around Tim Tebow before you find out he is just as, if not more, passionate about Jesus Christ? About five seconds. It doesn't take long for people to figure out what we're passionate about. And it's okay that we're passionate about more than one thing, but if we leave out a passion for Jesus, we have fallen short of what really matters. You say, well, Pastor, I'm, I'm curious as to how am I going to figure out what I'm really passionate about? Unless someone comes and tells me, or you know, Jesus gets off the throne and beats me around a little bit, how, how am I going to figure that out? All you have to do is look at what you talk about the most, Look at where you're spending your money. Look at where you're spending your time. It won't take long for you to figure out what you're passionate about. And it's possible that some of those passions that we have, if we're being honest, are pretty meaningless, pretty empty. It's possible that maybe we need a greater passion for Jesus to accompany those passions that are good. And if that's the case, if, if we look at the, our passions that we have and we say, well, okay, this one, this one needs some work. This one needs to change. Here's some good news. You ready? Good news is this. Paul is proof that Jesus Christ can change our passions. Paul is proof that when, when we meet the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit has the power to transform us and transform our passions into those things that really matter. All we have to do is ask. All we have to do is ask. A simple prayer every day. Lord, help me to be more passionate about you today. 
Let me close with this one thought. Just one, uh, one last question, that's this. Is it possible that maybe where you're at spiritually is you're kind of like Saul on his road to Damascus and you are an enemy of Jesus and maybe you don't even know it. Saul didn't even realize that that's what was going on in his life until it was pointed out to him. So let me do my best to point out to you the truth of God's Word, and that is this. If you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you've not done that, the Bible describes you as a sinner and an enemy of God. But you don't have to stay in that spiritual condition. The Bible is very clear that if we trust Jesus Christ in His death and His resurrection, in His blood alone, not Jesus plus anything, Jesus, 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 to forgive us of sin. Jesus to rescue our soul. Jesus to transform our life. Jesus to transform our passions. If that's where our faith is at, and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside us and transforms us from the inside out, it's an amazing thing to watch happen in someone's life. And He can do that for you today, right now. Christian, you believe that? Amen. Amen. Father, thanks so much that we are able to be in your presence. And I thank you for this example in Paul's life that reminds us that you have the power to change a life. That reminds us that you have the power to change our passions from some things that are meaningless and empty to something that's going to matter in eternity. To even take those, those passions that are good and make them so much more than they are in themselves. Help us to be a more passionate people a more passionate church about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to be passionate about God's grace and day by day become more and more passionate about Jesus. Well, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and we'll finish with the song. If you have a spiritual need, if you want to pray about it, I'll be here.
us the passion that we just sang about in that song. A passion every day that says, I refuse to make another excuse to not live my life for you and to share the gospel in God's grace. Give us that passion that we need to live our <coughs> gospel message day by day. We pray it in Jesus' name. And the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.